All righty, guys. So it is 6.01. I'm going to go ahead and get started here. Uh, so today is the last presentation of the semester, um, and I'm really excited that you guys are here to be there for it. So announcements before we get started. Uh, look at on Canvas, look at final exam logistics. It was an announcement that was made a couple of days ago. Uh, that's really important information to make sure that you understand everything that's going on there for your final exam upcoming in the next week or so. Besides that, recitation worksheets will get posted and uploaded like normal. That'll be under Canvas, Files, Recitation, and then Worksheets. So today what we're going to do is we're going to cover PRIMS, and then we're also going to cover some of the topics that you guys selected um, from um, this survey I put out a couple days ago. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. So the first algorithm we're going to cover today is actually going to be PRIMS algorithm. Right, Prim's algorithm is a minimum spanning tree algorithm, so I'm just going to very, very extremely briefly talk about the PowerPoint slides um, and talk about what a minimum spanning tree is. For those who don't remember, um, remember the disconnected graph cannot have an MST. A minimum spanning tree is basically it spans every single vertex in the graph, only uses the, the edges that exist uh, on the graph. Right, so it's a stripped down graph with unnecessary edges. That's a good. That's a good way to put it. Um, graphs can contain multiple MSTs. Uh, one thing that's important to note is that you always have, always you will have um, two times V minus one edges um, if you're adding both the forward and reverse edge. Um, if you're only adding the edges in one direction, you'll have the number of vertices minus one. And I'll show you an example of that right now. If I were to have a, I'm going to span into for this graph, I would have one, two, three, four, five um, uh, edges. Uh, if I was adding the reverse edges, it must be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, right? And so if I would actually have 10 directed edges, and then I have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 uh, vertices. So 6 times 2 minus 2 is, um, or 6 minus 1 times 2 is 10. That's the correct number of vertices. So that'll actually be our terminating condition for cross schools, the one algorithm we explored last week, as well as the algorithm we're going to cover today, PRIMS. I'm going to see if there's anything else It's important. This is the terminating condition, also the validity check. Yep, we only want to return an MST if uh, if it is a valid MST, right? And for a valid MST, strict definition, if it doesn't have V minus one or two times the quantity V minus one edges, the MST isn't valid, um, and therefore we do not have a valid minimum spanning tree. Cool. So I'm going to go ahead and move on to the whiteboard where I have kind of an outline of prims. I'm going to do the example online or on the Viz tool, uh, but I wanted to go over just a couple of the features of it on the whiteboard. So let me go over there. Let's go into the whiteboard. Cool. Uh, yeah. All righty. Cool. So. Nice. And then if somebody could put in live recitation question when they hear this, just the audio is working fine. I just want to make sure that that's the case before I get any further. So TAs that are watching the chat, whenever you hear this, just put a little note in the in the channel just so I know. Okay, cool. So PRIMS. PRIMS is a greedy algorithm. Uh, the second greedy algorithm we've covered in this course. Uh, well, yeah, second greedy algorithm we've covered in this course in addition to cross schools. It is also an MST algorithm. But what's unique about PRIMS compared to cross schools is that PRIMS uses a starting vertex. Right, a starting vertex, just like we saw in BFS, like we saw in DFS, and like we've seen in Dijkstra's. Right, this is different compared to cross schools, which kind of basically just takes the cheapest edge at any given point uh, without trying to cause a cycle. As opposed to PRIMS, it actually is performed given a starting vertex in the graph. Right, and that's not to say that you still couldn't have multiple versions of a valid MSC given the same starting vertex. Right, that's still very, very possible if you have wedges, uh, if you have edges that are equivalent weights. Um, cool. So. Yep, you're all good. Cool. All right. So I just want to make sure my audio is good. Um, yeah, it only works on undirected graphs. That's just because of our definition of a minimum spanning tree. That's no different than cross schools as we explored last week. Um, it just doesn't really make sense if you are having a directed graph just because of the way that you can't maybe get from one uh, one vertex to the other vertex. It wouldn't make a lot of sense. Okay. Anyways, we represent the MST as a set of edges. That's no different as cross schools. A lot of these points are really hanging on the same thing as cross schools, just except that we use a starting vertex. Um, and then the only thing that is different than cross schools is we use a visited set. And this is just a hash set, the same kind of visited set we use in BFS, DFS, and Dijkstra's. And you'll keep hearing me harp on that 
because essentially a lot of these algorithms are very, very similar just with a short, a few short, uh, small modifications. So we use a visited set because we have a starting vertex. We don't have to worry about cycles uh, occurring because clusters are merging together. We basically, since we only have the MST is protruding from one single vertex, all we have to do is check if that vertex intersects with any of the other vertexes we've already seen. Since that edge would cause a cycle, we don't have to worry about kind of clustering that we had to use a disjoint set for in cross schools. Cool. Anyway, so I'm going to get straight into the algorithm. Uh, maybe going a little bit fast today, but we've got a lot to cover, and I want to make sure that we get to all of it. So, friends, first thing we need to do is we need to just mark the starting vertex as visited, right? We're going to mark the starting vertex as visited. We're actually going to initialize our three structures, uh, one of which is the priority queue. The priority queue is going to allow us to dequeue the cheapest edge that we have currently in the priority queue, right? That kind of lends itself to the greedy algorithm nature. Generally, greedy algorithms are going to have a priority queue of some sort. We're gonna have a visited set, right? A visited set for seeing that it's, it's made up of vert vertices. When we have a vertex, vertex that we visited, we add it to this set to make sure that we don't potentially add another edge that may cause a cycle in our MST. Um, and then finally, we have our, just the MST itself uh, that we're representing as a set, a set of edges, we'd also initialize that as well. After we've done all those three things, we're going to mark the starting vertex as very visited because we have visited it, we've considered it at first. And then we're going to enqueue all the edges extend, um, extending from the start to the priority queue, right? So given I, you know, my graph looks something like this, and this was the start, and I had these edges over here, I would go ahead, I would go ahead and queue this edge, this edge, and this edge, but not these two. Right? I'm only extending and enqueuing edges that are extending from uh, the start vertex. Cool. So next thing we're gonna do is that now we basically have the setup for our algorithm. And notice this is seemingly very similar to BFS. We're going to dequeue an edge from the priority queue, right? Or similar to BF, BFS, DFS, and Dijkstra's really. Um, most similar to Dijkstra's, I guess. But we're gonna dequeue an edge from the priority queue. We're gonna see, have we visited, would, would adding this edge cause a cycle? And we can tell if adding this edge would cause a cycle uh, by simply nature of if one of the vertex is not in the visited set. If they're one of the vertex vertices associated with this edge, right? Notice how each edge kind of has a U and a V vertex. The U is where it started from, and the V is where kind of called the destination vertex. If V does not exist in the visited set, if V not in, I don't know how visible this is, but is not in the visited set, then adding this uh, edge would actually not cause a cycle on our MST. So we go ahead and add it to our MST. Cool. So as long as this edge does not create a cycle, because we now we've checked that V is not in the visited set, well, then we have three things we have to do. Well, first, we're going to add the edge to the MST because we want it to be part of our MST now. It's the cheapest edge that doesn't cause a cycle, so we want to include it. Um, that also means adding the reverse edge uh, if, you're, if that's kind of the implementation you're working with. Generally, in our homeworks for 1332, we do require you to add both the forward, ed forward edge and the backwards edge. Um, so that just means add an edge going from U to V and then make an another edge that's going from V to U. Um, so add the edge and the reverse edge if necessary. Uh, depending on your implementation, to the to the MST. Then we're going to mark the unvisited vertex, right? Generally destination V or V vertex. We're going to mark that as visited, right? Because now we have visited this vertex. We've added an edge that extends out to this vertex. So we're going to consider that visited. And then from there, we're just going to enqueue adjacent edges, basically enqueue adjacent neighbors, um, whose destination vertex is not in the visited set. And this is an optimization over here. This is an optimization over here. You could add just all neighbors, and then when you're uh, when you're dequeuing from the priority queue, this check will take care of it. But in theory, for me at least, why would you want to add an edge to the priority queue if you already know that you've visited? Um, if you already know that you've visited uh, that vertex, since there's no chance that you would ever consider that edge to your MST anyways, so why go ahead and waste the space by putting it into your queue in your priority queue? Um, so once you've done that, basically you just head back to the top of the list and until either an MST is found or the priority queue is empty, you continue this. When I'm saying until an MST is found, that goes back to our validity check I mentioned before. Basically, an MST is guaranteed to have two times, uh, right? It's guaranteed to have this number, right? If this is if you're adding both the forward edge and the reverse edge, right? That was what I showed you at the very beginning with the slide. If you're adding both the reverse edge and the, um, the forward edge and the reverse edge, then you're going to have the number of vertices minus one times two, right? If you were only counting, uh, not adding the, adding the reverse edge, it would just look like this. So as soon as you, the size of your MST, by calling like dot size, 
as soon as the size of your MST is equal to this, well, then you're done. There's no reason to consider any edges past that because you visited everything. Um, or if your priority queue is empty, then you'd also stop the algorithm. Right? If there's nothing left to pull from your priority queue, well, then there's no MSTs actually that exist. Uh, there's another thing with prims that you could use instead of doing, using this as a validity check. You could also check if the size of the visited set is the size of the number of vertices. Um, but I just like using this because eventually we have to validate our MST anyways. Um, and so this is the same exact terminating check there as well. Notice that both of those checks, either checking the size of the visited sets against each other or checking the size of, uh, checking the, size of the MST versus this, uh, like the size of um, the number of vertices minus one times two, all of those are both O of one. So there's not really a difference in performance no matter which one you choose. Cool. So the thing is, after we break out of this loop, either once we found an MST or the priority queue has run dry, right? If priority queue running dry would be the case in a disconnected graph. Well, we just don't want to return the MST for no reason because the MST might not be valid. If it's a disconnected graph, I don't want to return the user a MST that isn't really an MST. So what we're going to do is we're going to validate the MST. And the easiest way of validating the MST is by once again checking if the number of ver or the number of edges in the edge set is two times the number of vertices minus one, right? Two times the quantity number of vertices minus one. If it is, we go ahead and return uh, the MST. If it's not, if this is not the case, if it has less than this, well, then in that case, we probably return null, maybe throw an exception, probably be implementation specific. I think usually in our homeworks, we ask you to return null though. It's kind of like a sentinel value. Uh, okay, cool. So I guess I'll do the efficiency now because I wrote it here and I was going to write it later, but I guess I had a brain fart. Um, the complexity here is actually the same as it was for Dijkstra's, right? And that really comes from kind of the same process. Essentially what you're doing is you're enqueuing. On average, you're going to be enqueuing um, E edges and you're going to be dequeuing from them log V times, right? And so by doing that, eventually, if you know, cause you can take, you can distribute this log to both of these, um, but eventually the cost is, uh, basically you're applying log V to the quantity E plus V. And this is similar to, as we saw in Dijkstra's, the explanation is very, very similar. Um, and basically what it's doing is, oops, I need an extra parentheses over here. Um, in BFS and DFS, the complexity is just E plus V, right? And when we're, when we're adding this priority queue and we're involving this, then basically all we do is just apply the log V, we apply log V to both of these terms, right? Since the priority queue, whenever we're dequeuing, this is kind of a log, a logarithmic operation. And it's, bound, it's log V because in, on average, we're gonna be dequeuing V vertices. So cool, that is prims. I'm gonna go ahead and show you guys an example on the biz tool because I think that'll probably be much more helpful than seeing it over here on the board. So I'm gonna move over there and pivot. All righty, cool. So I have over here, I have the viz tool. Um, I wanted to go over here and add my face cam, but it's okay. It doesn't really matter. Okay, cool. So what we're going to be doing here is that now I've given this graph. This is the same graph when you pull up the viz tool, right? So you could follow along with me if you just want to go to csvizstool.com, go to prims, and then select A as your starting vertex. But basically what's going to happen here is uh, A is our starting vertex. So we've marked that as visited. And then we're going to add those adjacent edges, those neighboring edges. That would be AB1 and AC5. So we're going to add those both to the priority queue, AB1, AC5, cool. It's going to heapify. And then I'm going to DQ that cheapest edge. I'm going to DQ that cheapest edge. And now I see that while A has been visited, is in my visited set, B has not, right? And that means that I can add this AB edge without causing a cycle on my MST. And that makes sense. I mean, there's no MST right now, so adding that first edge will definitely not cause a cycle. But we'll see as we go later on that this check will check, will, uh, if it fails, that would be that would be because adding that edge would cause a cycle. So I'm going to go ahead and step forward. I'm going to add this to my. Um, I'm going to add AB to the MST. Cool. And then I'm going to add B to the visit set, as you can see over here. Uh, and then I'm going to go ahead and add B's neighbors. So I'm going to add probably BC, BD, and then BG in that order. I'm following the same order as kind of alphabetical ordering of these numbers. Hopefully the visual does the same. Um, yep, I will first actually, it's gonna, it's gonna try adding this BA edge. 
However, A is in the visited set, so we're actually not going to add it. This was the optimization that I talked about um, that I underlined earlier. Cool. So that's not going to count. Then it's going to go to A, A, C. C is not in the visited set over here, so we're fine to go ahead and add it. Nice. I'm going to go ahead and, and add B, D. Nice. And then I'm going to go ahead and add B, G. Cool. And so now it's going to heapify this to make sure that the cheapest edge, B, G, 1, goes to the top of the priority queue. Um, and then after that, what I'm going to do now, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to DQ from the priority queue again. So I'm going to DQ this edge BG1. So we'll see, BG1. G is not in the visited set, so I'm fine to consider this edge and add it to my MST, right? Add BG to the MST, cool. Um, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to add G to my visited set, as you can see over here. And then I'm going to uh, iterate over G's neighbor. So first, I'm actually going to try and add this GB edge. B, however, has already been visited, so there's no reason to add this uh, edge to the priority queue because, well, I've already found the cheapest edge connecting to B. There's no reason for me to add this one as well. Cool. So I'm not going to add this one. Then I'll go over ahead and uh, go to third, uh, GC. C hasn't been added uh, to the visited set, although there is an edge in the priority queue that does have this, uh, that does have C as a vertex. And then I'm going to go ahead and add uh, E would be the next one. That's fine. F is going to be the next one. That's fine. And then I'm going to go ahead and add H as well. So now at the end of this, GF2 is going to be my cheapest edge left in the priority queue. So I'm going to go ahead and DQ right here. When I DQ, I see that F is not my visited set. Cool. I'm free to add this to my MST. This is line's going to turn blue. Nice. Uh, I'm going to add F to my visited set. Cool. And then from there, what I'm going to do is I'm going to iterate over F's neighbors. First, I'm going to try uh, D, actually. FD, just going by alphabetic ordering. I'm going to go over here, and I'm going to add FD with a weight of 4. Cool. Well, D hasn't been visited first. D hasn't been visited. Nice. Then I'm going to add uh, G. G hasn't been visited, so I'm not going to add that edge at all. And then H has not as well either. So I'm going to go ahead and add FH0. Notice how FH0 is going to become is going to become the root of the priority queue. And now upon dequeuing, now I've once again greedily chosen the cheapest edge remaining in my priority queue. And this is FH. H is not in my visited set, so I'm free to consider it. Add it to my MST. And then from there, I'm going to add H to my visited set. Because now I've officially visited it. I've added the cheapest vertex that touches it. Cool. Then from there, I'm going to iterate over H as neighbors. Notice how algorithmic this is. I've already added A, F, so I don't do that. And then notice how I'm also not going to add G. I'm not going to add this HG edge. And this is the first time where we've seen that it's not the only edge it's not adding is not the edge it just took. I've already visited G, right? G is in my visited set. So there's no reason to add this ed edge at HG3, right? Because there's no reason I'd ever consider it because adding this edge would clearly cause a cycle, right? And that's how, we, that's how the visited set really gets its purpose is by checking if that destination vertex, that V vertex in this case, is in the visited set. If it is, that would certainly cause a cycle. So in this case, I'm not going to add this edge to my priority queue and I'm actually going to discard it. Cool. Next, I'm going to DQ GH. Uh, oops, I'm going to add GH, which is actually added way before when I was at G. Notice how H has already been visited. So this edge is actually going to get discarded. H has already been visited, skipping. Nice. And now I do the same thing again. I'm going to DQ uh, from the priority queue. FD, nice. D is not in the visited set. That's fine. Then I'm going ahead and add FD to the MST. I'm going to add D to my visited set over here. Nice. And then I'm going to iterate over D's neighbors. Notice how both of these, however, I've already visited, so both of these are going to get discarded. B is going to get discarded, and S is going to get discarded. Nice. And then now this would be when I go back to the top of my loop. And what's actually happening there is I'm actually testing my validity condition. One, is my priority queue empty? No, because there's still edges in here. And two, have I obtained a valid MST? And that can be checked by seeing, do I have the correct number of edges? To be specific, two times the quantity V minus one. Right? I know I'm saying that a lot, but I really want to burn that into your minds. So that is always the, uh, the termination check when you're dealing with MSTs, minimum spanning trees. So now the terminating conditions have been reached, so I'm going to go ahead and DQ again. Perfectly fine. So I'm going to go ahead and DQ AC. C has not been visited, so I'm fine to consider this edge. So I'm going to add a, AC to the MST, add C to my visited set, and then I'm going to iterate over uh, C's neighbors. Note that all of them, however, have all been visited, so I'm going to discard all three of them. Skipping, skipping, and skipping. Nice. BC7, I've already been to uh, C. 
This was in queued a while ago. Um, so then I'm actually going to discard this one as well. Yep, I'm going to skip. I'm going to DQ BD. And then from there, what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to DQ BD. And then from there, I am going to realize that D is also my visited set. Cool. And then I'm going to do GE. GE is, um, e is not in the visited set, so I'm fine to add this one. So I add it. And then I'm going to add E to the visited set. And then I'm going to add, uh, try and add its neighbors. Notice how G has already been visited. So I'm not going to consider this one. And this is the case where I actually will hit the terminating condition, right? Notice how the priority queue is still not empty. There's still an edge in there. But the number of uh, edges I have is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, right? And I have one, well, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight vertices, right? So you can see if I were adding uh, reverse edges, then I would have two times eight minus one, seven, two times seven is 14, right? And I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, right? So I've hit my validity check. Hopefully it says that above. Yeah, MST is the correct amount of edges. All stats, all vertices have been visited. And now I'm done. So that right there is going to be your MST or one of the valid MSTs for this graph, right? Starting from the vertex set. So I'll wait a second for questions over here. And then if not, I'm going to move on to the next topic, which is the beginning of our review topics. Okay, cool. All righty. Mm, let's see what's on next. Doesn't seem like I have any other questions, so I'm going ahead and move on. I think next is Kruskal's review. Um, Kruskal's review, I'm honestly just going to go through another example in the Viz tool. I don't feel like it's worth writing out again. Um, so I'm actually going to go over here. I have another example set up for Kruskal's. And really, I think that doing these back to back is actually really helpful because by doing this, you can really see the differences in the algorithms and kind of their similarities as well. So if we remember from last week, cross schools is another MSC algorithm. Um, but instead of using, basically the difference is, is that instead of uh, using a starting vertex, it does not use a starting vertex. It just greedily chooses um, the cheapest edge at every single point in the algorithm. And so by doing that, we really can't have a visited set be to decide if we, if an edge would cause a cycle because we're, Basically, the MST will kind of form in clusters and not as sort of protruding from one single vertice like it was doing with that A over here. So by doing that, we have this funny little structure called a disjoint set. And the disjoint set really has two operations that are useful. One is find and one is union. Find, given uh, calling find on um, a single, on an object in a disjoint set, will return kind of an ID uh, for that cluster. Right? And think of it as clusters. And basically that means that if two elements are in the same cluster, calling find on either of them will return the same value, right? And so basically by doing this, we can check if adding this edge would cause a cycle or not, because if find produces the same um, ID or root, then adding this edge would most certainly cause a cycle. So by using find, we can avoid adding an edge that would cause a cycle to our MST. And this is basically doing the, the contains check um, or the, that we've usually been doing on our visited set. Although we just have to do this workaround um, since our MSTs kind of forms in clusters. The only other uh, useful, the, the other useful operation on a disjoint set is union, right? And this is kind of adding to our visited set. When I call union, it unions the two clusters together. So that now if I were to call find on any object in either of those two, in the previous two clusters, now they all return the same ID, right? So I'm kind of unioning those uh, those clusters together, they're, they're actually trees. Um, that's what's going on. And so by doing that, uh, we can perform cross goals on a graph and greedily choose the cheapest edge every single time, making sure I don't add a, a, a cause a cycle, and then actually have the same terminating conditions I had for prims um, in the last algorithm. So cool. I'm going to go ahead and fire this one up. So I'm going to hit run. Notice how there's no starting vertex. I'm going to hit run, and I'm going to pause. Whoa, hold the phone. Um, 
So right now, what actually happens with Cruscos is that since I don't have a starting vertex, I literally just add, I just dump all of the edges uh, from the graph into the priority queue. That's literally what happens. Um, and in doing so, now I really have all of the edges that are ordered. So now I'm gonna dequeue from the priority queue, same way as I was dequeuing from the priority queue with prims. And I'm gonna check, okay. Now I'm gonna check, I'm gonna dequeue FH, this is the cheapest edge. I say from FH, okay. Our F and H, would adding this cause a cycle? The way I can check that is by checking if the IDs, let's notice how this is the vertex and the set ID, which if their IDs are different, then adding this edge will most certainly not create a cycle. So since F's uh, root is, or F's ID is six and H's ID is eight, adding this edge will not cause a, or will not um, cause a cycle. So I'm free to add to my NST. Nice, find F is six, cool. And then find H is eight, or find H is eight. Those do not equal, so I'm free to add it. Cool. Now I'm going to union these two together because now F and H are in the same cluster. And so by doing so, what basically is happening here is that now I'm going to map an ID of one onto the ID of the other. Cool. So now H's ID is going to get changed to six. So now if I were to call fine on F or H, they would both give me six. So cool. Moving on, I'm going to DQ the cheapest edge again, which is AB1. AB1, I do the same thing. I check, okay, do A and B have the same IDs? No, they don't, so I'm going to be free to add it. Find if A is one, find if B is two. Those are not the same, so I'm free to add this edge. Cool. Now I'm going to union them together. So now B is also going to have an ID of one. Now they're in the same kind of cluster over here. And we can see how these clusters are kind of forming. One's over here at the top, and one's kind of here at the bottom. This is why we have to use a disjoint set to represent uh, kind of the visited set for this algorithm is because they're not all protru protruding from the same vertex and all connected. Um, since the MST kind of forms in a disconnected fashion and then eventually will connect up, um, we have to use a disjoint set to make sure that adding an edge doesn't uh, cause the same cluster to have a cycle with itself. Cool. So I'm going to go ahead and step forward. I'm going to DQ again. Um, or after I map B's value to one, I'm going to DQ again, BG. Notice how B's ID is one, but G's ID is seven. One is not equal to seven, so I'm free to add this to the MST. I'm actually going to map. Then I'm going to go ahead and union the two together. So now G is going to have a ID of one. Cool. Now A, B, and G all have an ID of one. Um, as you can see over here, if I were to call fine on A, B, or G, they would all return to me one. They have the same set ID. Stepping forward, I get to FG. Now I'm going to see FG. Now this is the first interesting part. Is where This is where discrepancy between a visited set and disjoint set is necessary. With a visited set, I'd say, okay, well, both these edges are, or both these vertexes are visited, so adding this edge would cause a cycle on my MST. However, Prims is smart enough using a disjoint set to see that the ID of F is six and the ID of G is one. So since they're in different clusters, adding this edge is perfectly fine, right? So I'm gonna see F is, uh, has an ID of six and G has an ID of one, cool. They're both different, so I'm free to add this edge. But now, this is the, this is the kicker, is that uh, F and H will now merge and be in the same set ID as A, B, and G. You see that now is that six is gonna be moved to one, A is moved to one. Notice how they're all in the same cluster now. A, B, G, F, and H are all connected, right? They're in kind of this MST that's stemming, that's kind of spanning this part of the tree over here, or the, the graph. And so they all must have the same ID. Calling fine on any of these vertices would all return to me the same ID, the same set ID of one, as it's noted over here on the left. Moving on, H and G, uh, or GH, I guess the order doesn't really matter. Notice how this time G and H, well, G and H are in the same cluster, right? And we can see visually that adding this edge would cause a cycle in our MST. So notice how we check that the find of G is one, the find of H is one, that's bad news bears. Since these are equal, we're actually going to end up discarding this edge because adding this edge would cause a cycle. First, in the same set, skip edge. Yep, exactly correct. I'm going to go to DF now. This is going to be fine. I'm going to start to go a little bit quicker. Uh, D and F are going to have different set IDs, so this is fine. Yep, I'm going to go ahead and add DF. Union uh, D to F. And so now F has an ID of one. We can really see how this MSD is really just kind of, this one cluster is really starting to dominate over here. I'm going to do the same thing again. I'm going to DQ AC. Same thing. A and C are going to be in different disjoint sets, one and three. Or different clusters, mind me. So they're different. I'm free to add it. And then I'm going to uh, union A or C and A together. So now they have all have the same ID as one. 
And we see really the only one that's actually going to end up mattering is E, but we're not there yet. B, C, both are going to have the same ID of, as 1. So this is not going to get added to the MST. 1 is equal to 1. This is the same set, skip edge. Exactly. This is the utility of using that disjoint set. B and D is going to be the same thing, right? They're both in the same set. B and D both have 1. We can clearly see that adding this would cause a cycle, and we are going to discard this edge as well. Now E, G, right? Cool. Now E has a mapping of 5, or has a root, or an idea of 5, and G has 1 of 1. Since these two are different, I'm free to go ahead and add. Nice. And now we're going to hit the terminating condition for our algorithm. Uh, it's the same terminating condition I, we have for prims. It's that the size of the MST is going to have 2 times the quantity V minus 1 edges. So I have 1, 2, 3. Four, five, six, seven, eight. And then I have, um, let's see how many edges I'm going to have. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. Right? So I'm going to have eight minus one, seven times two, fourteen. Fourteen equals the fourteen uh, edges I have in my MST. So I've, I can terminate the algorithm. There's no need to consider C and G after I map that. Yep. And the MST is the correct amount of edges, and we're done. Right? We still have to validate that MST is valid, right? The priority queue might have, or the algorithm might have terminated because the priority queue was empty in the event of a disconnected graph. So we still have to do that, um, the same size check I just did, right? Checking the, uh, the quantity two times V minus one is equal to the number of edges in the MST. Um, we still have to do that as well to validate that this is a valid MST. Cool. Alrighty, so I'm gonna wait for questions on Kruskal's. Um, and in the meantime, yeah, wait for that for a second. And just to note, the complexity of this algorithm is not super easy to come, um, come up with off the, top of, off the top of your head. It's actually O of E log B, right? And this basically uh, comes from a variety of things. Basically, all of these disjoint operations are O of 1. Um, we're still dequeuing from the priority queue, and that kind of leads to our log B. Um, we're building the priority queue with um, E edges. That's an O of E operation. Um, the majority of the rest of the proof for why the complexity is what it is is well beyond the scope of the course. Really, as long as you know that it's O of E log V, that's perfectly fine. That's enough. If you want to follow up and ask why the complexity is what it is, feel free to email me. Um, that's perfectly fine. But essentially what's happening, um, but those are the main things that are uh, occurring with the algorithm. Alrighty, so assuming there are no more questions, I'm going to go on to the next topic, which was, so I've done MS, I've done prims, I've done um, cross schools, now I'm on to LCFs, cool. I put my notes over on this uh, table over here. And I'm really wondering why I didn't have my water. So it's beginning to get a little bit dry, but that's okay. Um, next, let's go over here and talk about LCS. So LCS, longest common subsequence. Right, so we talked about subsequences in uh, the past. Um, we talked about subsequences last week. Essentially, what a subsequence is is a subset of the characters that are in a string that are not necessarily um, that are in the same relative ordering, but not necessarily consecutive to each other. Uh, so, for example, I could do, um, for instance, uh, if my name is Landon, right? If my name is Landon, then like L and D would be a valid um, L and D would be a valid subsequence. Um, let's see for service over here, a valid one would be uh, let's say I could do S V E, right? Notice how S comes before the V, which comes before the E. Um, that's perfectly fine. Serve would be one. However, notice if I had service that I couldn't have. Um, Uh, like for instance, ice V is not a valid one because the V actually becomes before 
the I over here, right? Uh, cool. So that's kind of subsequences. It's a subset of the characters that are in a uh, in a string. Um, they, they don't necessarily have to be consecutive to each other, but their relative ordering must stay intact. Um, I can do more examples of this, but I don't want to get really waste your guys' time. Let me see if there are a few more examples on the guide I had over here. Let's see. Yep, these are the ones that I used yesterday or last week. So for brown, we have bro, bond, brown, R W N or O. For Nazi subsequences, B O R, right? Because the R actually comes before the O, so this is broken. Obviously, all of them backwards will be broken. Any character that is not in the original uh, string, if that's in there, clearly that's not going to be a subsequence. Uh, and neither is N W, right? The opposite ordering of N and W over here. Cool. So the LCS problem itself is that given a string with length m and a string y of length m, uh, what is the longest subsequence that appears in both strings? Yeah. Um, and what's really, really important here is this, it's not as important how to code the algorithm, although that is kind of denoted, literally is denoted right here. What's more important is how to fill in the table. And I'm here to show you guys how to fill in the table. The table is, is pretty actually pretty relatively intuitive to figure out. So I'm going to go ahead and hit run. I'm going to pause right here. So notice how I put, this is a 2D array, right, of length n plus 1 and m, m plus 1, right? And basically what's happening is I have, you know, uh, S1 over here and S2, oops, sorry, S1 over here and S2 along the uh, y-axis. What's happening is that at every, I have these uh, row of zeros and this column of zeros is because we're going to be indexing, uh, sometimes we need to index the character up and to the left, right? Um, and so that would be, if this was, you know, if this index, this index is one comma one, if I want to index the character up into the left from the diagonal up, I have to subtract one from both the horizontal and the vertical. So one, one becomes zero, zero, right? So if I didn't have these extra zero columns, then I would potentially index out of bounds here. I have to edge case something, um, which wouldn't really be super awesome. So we kind of add this extra row and column here. Uh, to kind of mitigate that, to ease that kind of edge case of potentially going outside the bounds of the 2D array. But really, the algorithm is pretty simple. What you do is you say, okay, do these two characters match? At this specific cell, at this specific cell, do they match? If they do match, then you want to take the value from whatever the diagonal was, and then all we want to do is increment that by one, right? So whatever um, at the table, let's just call it you know, matrix, if they're equal, then I'm actually going to assign one plus the value along the diagonal. X minus one, Y minus one is actually this value right here. This value was zero, so adding one of that is one. That's what you do in the case of a match. A match is pretty easy. The other case, however, is if you get things that do not match. If they do not match, you're gonna fall into this else statement over here. And what happens then is you either wanna take the max going up or the max going to the left, right? And what you're doing there is you're basically saying that, okay, well, SU is not gonna be a match, but I could still include a match from um, SS over here. The longest running subs, longest common subsequence up to this point is actually the SS over here, right? So I'm going to carry that one through um, and keep maintain the max longest sum and subsequence up to that point, which is still one. Going forward with R, this is going to be the same thing. They do not match, so I fall into this L statement, and then I'm take the max of either to the left or above, right? And this is exactly how you'd fill out a table if you were to see it on an exam: is that you really there's only two cases you have to worry about. If there's a match pull from the diagonal and add one. If there's not a match, um, then all you have to do is just take the max of either uh, the cell immediately adjacent to the left or immediately above that other one. Cool. So in this case, I'm gonna keep on dragging that one over. Uh, v, they don't match either. Cool, then I get to I, still don't match. I'm gonna keep on pulling this one over, keep on pulling the max over here from the left. And notice how basically, if I were to consider any of these substrings, SUR, SURV, SURVI, they all still include this subsequence or this substring of one, or sorry, subsequence of one, right? They all have this S in common, right? No matter how long this word gets, well, I have at least a um, size one, right? Because what I'm doing is I these they have both have these S in common over here. So that's gonna happen when we're stringing along um, when we're taking that max uh, from the left over there. Cool. So this in the other case, uh, none of these are going to match either. Now, in this case, I'm actually going to pull from the above one. And what this is saying is that, okay, well, SE and S is not a match. Uh, that's certainly not to say that SS is not a match, right? Up until this point, the longest match is including this SS over here. 
So I'm going to pull from the top, and that's a one. Now these don't match either. Now it's going to say, okay, well, I can either take, I want to take the max from either SE and S, that's this cell, or S and SU, that's this cell. Maxes are the same, so it doesn't matter which one you pull, right? I'm going to pull from, it doesn't really matter, it's implementation specific, so they're the same. Um, the same thing is going to happen here. It's basically going to string this longest common subsequence along all the way over here, right? So this is a one, the is a one, all these are going to be ones. I'm not going to go through it fairly fast because it's pretty repetitive. Then we get to R. The same thing happens over here. These are not equal. So basically what I'm doing is I'm saying, okay, well, if I don't include anything from survivor and I only include SER, then the longest common subsequence is zero. But if I include SE and S, right, that's this cell, then I have a longest common subsequence of one. So I want to carry through that maximum longest common subsequence up until this point, which is still one. So a one's going to get mapped there. I pull from the top, one, cool. These still uh, or mismatch, so I'm going to keep pulling. Nice. I get to R, cool. Something cool is going to happen. The R's match up. So now what I want to do is I say, okay, what was the longest common subsequence before I considered these two characters, right? Before I considered this R and this R. Right? That was when I was dealing with SU and SE. SU and SE had an overlap of one, a longest common subsequence of one. So now if I were to tack on R and R over here, well, now I have a longest common subsequence of two. And this is really where the algorithm starts to come into play. And I'm really starting to uh, gain off of the matches that I had before. I'm starting to be able by pre-computing, um, basically I can use these smaller subcases to kind of build up to the bigger subcases and eventually once I've considered all of the characters in both directions, then I'll end up in this cell over here, and I'll have the final answer. So I've pulled that two. Now this two is going to end up getting string, strung along. Two, two, two. Something interesting is going to happen here, right? These R's match, so I'm going to pull from the diagonal, right? And you might say, oh, well, I could have just pulled from over here. But that's actually saying something different. If I pull from right here, that would be saying that survivo and sir have the longest common subsequence of two, which they do. Right, but what I'm saying is that survivo and SE had a longest common subsequence of one, and by tacking on this R and this R, I'm actually going to be able to increment this longest common subsequence by one. So one plus one is going to be two. And the same pro pro uh, process keeps on going on. The one's going to get pulled, the one's going to get pulled. Two's going to get pulled here because I'm going to consider SER and SUR, right? So that's the longest common subsequence up until that point is two. Now I get to the V. So now serve and serve. It's hard to pronounce the difference between the two, but they both have V in common, so I'm going to include, I'm going to add one to the diagonal. Nice. I'm going to add two, two plus one is three. Cool. And then from there, um, I'm basically going to end up stringing this uh, three common subsequence all the way along, this SRV there and the SRV here. It's going to get strung along, get carried from the left all the way across. Oh, actually, there was another one here. This was, I also got another match here, so I incremented two, uh, one from the diagonal, brought that down. Nice. And then R, the matching fails as well. So I'm going to skip through this a little bit fast. One's going to carry down, one's going to carry down. Mismatch, mismatch. Get to here, cool. Servi and Servi, right? So I'm actually going to increment by one because these I's match. And that's by saying SRV and SRV was the longest common subsequence up before I included these two characters. Now I'm going to tack on I here and I here, and I'm going to add one to that. So three plus one is four, cool. So now survey SRVI and SRVI is our longest common subsequence up to this point. This V is going to get, um, it's not a match, so I'm going to carry along that four. And that four is kind of getting strung along all the way. C, there are going to be no matches here, so I'm just going to bludgeon through this. I'm going to keep pulling from the top. Two, three, four, 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 and four. And then finally with E, I think there are no more matches here either. Nope. So these are going to keep on pulling from the max, which is the top. Nice. So now I'm done, right? So now I'm done, and I found that four is actually the longest common subsequence in my um, in my string. Um, so the, that's the length of longest common subsequence. But if I actually wanted to compute what the longest common subsequence is, what characters form that, there's actually another nifty thing that I have to do now. So what I'm going to do is basically what the algorithm is is then I'm going to go up and to the left. Um, so now you can see these kind of divided into these different boxes, right? So all the fours are contained within this box, the threes in this box, the twos in this box, and the ones in this box. And this isn't the coolest example because I don't really get to show the difference of going up and left as opposed to going left and then up. Um, but basically, whichever convention you follow, you might 
not in this case, but in some cases you might receive, you might have a different uh, longest common subsequence at the end of it. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm going to go up and basically what you do is you go up until you hit a bound, i.e. when you're at four and you're at three, then you stop going up and then you go left as long as you can. And then as soon as you hit three, then you're kind of in that bounding, that top left corner. And then from there, you're going to go along the diagonal and add that character or add the, the current character the long come subsequence, and then move out there. I'm gonna do the same thing. So I'm gonna go up here, or actually, this one goes does both at the same time, but that's okay. Um, so what's happening here? R O, nice. R O, and then V is gonna get added as well. Oops, not V. Sorry, I is gonna get added. Yep. And so notice how actually what we're doing is we're prepending. Uh, we're prepending the longest common subsequence up to the front, right? Because we're constructing it from the back forward. What's going to happen now is uh, V is going to get added. All right, sorry. Um, yeah, now V is going to get added. Cool. And then now R is going to get added. Yep. And then now 1, I'm going to go up to the left diagonal again, which is S. And then this character is also going to get added. And we go like that. So basically what happens is that whenever you, um, whenever the, um, Servier. Wait, this is odd. Mm, this is interesting because Servier is actually not the longest common subsequence because this doesn't contain a U. I don't know what's going on here, but basically what happens is that every single time you hit kind of this bounding box, that's going to be whenever you're going to add that value uh, as a valid character in your longest common subsequence. So I'm actually going to note this bug down right now. Um, Let's just get somebody. Um, okay, anyways, so now I'm gonna move on from LCS. The complexity of this is M times N, right? Because I'm basically, I'm gonna try and fill in every single cell in this table. So for every single character, I'm going to consider all the other characters um, over here, right? So if this is uh, N over here and this is M, for each character of M, I'm going to iterate, or I'm gonna do nine, or I'm gonna do M operations. And then what's happening, um, and then what's happening is that I'm gonna do that, if I'm doing M operations, I'm actually gonna end up doing that N times. So it's actually gonna come M times N. Um, so cool, I'm actually gonna take a screenshot of this just because it's, oops. Uh, all right, I'm gonna send this to, all right, cool. All right, so now I'm gonna move on and I'm gonna go on to uh, next thing, which is quick sort. And so I have 629, I still got some time. Cool. Okay, so quick sort. I move over to the super cool whiteboard now. Mm, let's see. Move back to the whiteboard. Cool. Um, and so let's talk about quick sort. So quick, so quick sort is a super cool algorithm. Quick sort basically is uh, the second divide and conquer algorithm we kind of cover in the course. Um, it's the second divide and conquer algorithm after merge sort. And what's happening with quicksort is that the goal is you're going to be able to pick a random pivot and then using partition, this is kind of called the partition part of an algorithm, our eventual goal is you want to place the pivot back in the perfect final location, right? So basically think about it is that every single time if you could randomly select an, uh, a value and then at the end of that iteration, be able to place it perfectly um, into its final spot in the array. Drop my marker, which is not cool. So then we need to talk about what does partition actually do? So what partition does is that after that random pivot is randomly chosen, right? We end up swapping that uh, random pivot to the front of that partition. And what we do is we have two variables. We have I and J. So I's goal is I starts directly at the beginning of the partition, directly after the pivot, and it tries to increment. It increments until it hits something, until either it is crossed with J or, or it has hit a value that is larger than the pivot, right? J, on the other hand, starts at the very, very end of the partition, right? And it tries to decrement as long as it's hitting 
or it changes decrement until either it crosses I or uh, or it hits a it hits a value that is uh, less than the pivot, right? And so basically, I wants to find I is going to keep on going in while it's finding small values. J is going to keep decrementing while it finds large values. When I finds a large value or J finds a small value, they stop. And what happens when they stop is that as long as they haven't swapped or as they haven't crossed yet, we swap the values at I and J. And what basically that does is it throws kind of the small element that was over on the on the larger half of the array, it throws it over to the left onto the smaller side, and the small or the sorry, it throws the smaller element to the left on the smaller side, and it throws the bigger element on the left to the right, which is kind of the bigger side, right? I know how good of an explanation that was. And then we continue to do that while I and J have not swapped. Right. And so basically by throwing small elements over to the left and by throwing large elements over to the right, at the end, what we're done is we basically what happens is when I and J cross, when I and J cross, everything that is less than the pivot is actually to the left of J. And everything to the right of the pivot is actually larger than J. Well, if the number if a number is larger than everything to the left of it and less than everything to the right of it, then it is in its final perfect location. And so what that means is then is what we do is we swap, uh, we swap the pivot back to J, and this is its final spot in the array. That's kind of the end of our partition algorithm, is that after we've thrown all the small values to the left and we've thrown all the large values to the right, we can once they finally cross each other, then we can swap the pivot back into J in its final location of the array. And then from there, all you have to do is recurse on the left half of the array and the right half of the array. And so by calling quicksort recursively on all of these, each time putting one element in its perfect location and continuing to throw large elements to the left and small elements, or sorry, large, or small elements to the left and large elements to the right, by doing this, eventually we are left with a sorted array, right? And so kind of what happens is, I'll explain the efficiency and properties in a little bit, but I want to do a quick, uh, I wanted to do a quick um, uh, example just to show you guys what's going on. So I'm moving my iPad over here so I can see questions, although, Seems like nobody's asking questions at 6.53 on a Tuesday. Anyways, so consider at this point, right? I had selected a um, random element from my, um, actually, I'll pick my random element is, let's say I'll pick a random index between uh, in the length of the array and I'll say it's two. So what happens is I'll swap six with four. This is me swapping the pivot to the beginning of the row, right? And what will happen now with I and J so what's going to happen is I is going to keep on going until it finds, it's going to keep incrementing until it finds something small or larger than the pivot, right? This is the pivot P. I'll know this by saying, right? Well, it already has. Eight is larger than six. So I is actually going to stop because it's already hit a super large element. J, on the other hand, is going to decrement until it finds an element smaller than the pivot. However, conveniently, it has already hit something smaller than the pivot in two. So now we have I pointing to a large element and J pointing to a small element, right? So what makes sense here is where, this is what I'm talking about by throwing a small element to the left and throwing a large element to the right. So by swapping these two, right? Swapping this over here, this over here, then I'm gonna be left with, oh, I'm gonna be left with six, this is a two. Right? And so now, two and eight are kind of on their relatively better sides of the array, right? Notice how they might necessarily be in their final locations, although, because right, because eight is not in its final location. Two happens to be, that was just a coincidence. But now it makes much more sense because eight shouldn't be on this left half of the array where all the small values should be. And then um, two shouldn't be over here where all the large values should be. So we've, by throwing the other two, by swapping the values at I and J, what we've done is we put large things over here on the right and small things over here on the left. So now I and J increment and decrement respectively. Now we've already considered those values, right? So now four, I is gonna keep incrementing until it hits something larger than the pivot, right? So four is not larger than the pivot, it goes on to three. Three is not larger than the pivot, it keeps incrementing again until it hits nine. Nine is larger than the pivot. So uh, I is actually gonna stop right here. And then J is gonna keep on going until it hits something that's smaller than the pivot. Happens to be that J is already at something smaller than the pivot, so nine and five are going to swap. So five's gonna get thrown over here. And then nine's gonna get yost over there. So by doing this, six, two, four, three, five, one, nine, eight. 
Cool. And then now I'm going to increment I and decrement J. So they're on top of each other. Cool. And then now what happens is I, once again, is looking to find something larger than the pivot. I is not larger than the pivot, so I is going to increment. And in doing so, it passes J. And by passing J, since I and J have crossed, we immediately terminate. We don't do any more comparisons. Because at this point, at this point, we know that J is the final, is the location of the final position for the pivot, right? And that makes sense. If we consider this, right, 2, 4, 3, and 5 are all less than 6. 9 and 8 are both larger than 6. So by definition, if I were to swap 6 right here, 6 is in its final location in the array, and I'm going to do so. Right, so I'm going to swap these two, so now it's 1, 2, 4, 3, 5, 6, 9, 8. And this was our this was our good old pivot. Notice how it's in its final location in the array. Six is not going to move, right? However, notice how the things to the left and right of it are not necessarily in their final location, but they are relative to the pivot. Everything to the left is smaller, and everything to the right is greater. So I'm going to note that. I'm going to say everything over here is greater, and everything over here is less than, right? And by doing this, by then I would uh, after this I would call uh, quick sort on this partition right here, this one over here, and then I would call quick sort on the right half, on the right side of the partition as well. And by doing this every single time, by doing this every single time, eventually the entire array becomes sorted, right? And the proof for kind of the complexity of this algorithm is a little bit beyond the scope of the class. Um, well, I'm explaining these. If you guys want another iteration, let me know. But if not, I'm just going to go on and go on to um, Dexter's to make sure we can cover that by the end of our station today. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and cover the efficiencies. So the efficiency of quicksort. So kind of what's going on is that uh, we are logarithmically kind of dividing the array, right? However, each time we're essentially going to be making n comparisons. So by doing that, log n times n iteration or n comparisons, right? This is, this becomes n log n, right? So this is O of n log n. And log n, right? However, this is only the best in the average, right? Because what we know, and it's important, is that if I choose a bad pivot, and I'll actually go ahead and do another example choosing a bad pivot, is go ahead and let me recurse on this left side over here. So imagine if I randomly at this point, if I randomly chose five to be my pivot, right? So five is my pivot, that means it swaps to the front, two, four, three, and one. Right, so then I starts here, and J starts here. Right, so I is going to look for something that's larger than the pivot. Is two larger than the pivot? No. Is four larger than the pivot? No. Is three larger than the pivot? No. Is one larger than the pivot? No. It actually is going to go right here. J is I. Or sorry, this is I. I is actually going to go exceed the bounds of the array. Right? And in doing so, I and J have crossed, and I get to swap 5 back to its final location in the array. Right? So now 1, 2, 4, 3, 5. Right? So notice how I didn't even do any swaps here. I literally, I just sent it all the way to the end of the partition. And by doing so, I didn't really throw any large elements to the right, and I didn't throw any small elements to the left. So in reality, by not throwing anything to either side, I didn't really get any benefit out of this iteration. I basically just did selection sort. I searched for the maximum element in this partition and then swapped it to its final location right there. So in doing so, what happens here is that I don't get any of the logarithmic benefit that I was doing before. And what actually happens is that it kind of devolves into selection sort. And by doing so, if I, so, that means that if I were to choose the min or the max pivot every single time, i.e. a bad pivot, then I'm left with a complexity that's actually n squared, right? Actually identical to selection sort. And so basically, well, the one thing, another thing I want to point out is that we want our pivot to kind of be in the middle of our partition. Because if it's in the middle of our partition, then we're going to be doing the most amount of swaps between I and J, right? And the most amount of fast. We're going to be throwing the most amount of things to the left and throwing the most amount of things to the right, right? Or a good amount of things. And by doing so, we kind of tend and we kind of approach getting sorted much more quickly than if we never do any swaps and we kind of divulge in the selection sort. So that was just a little trivia for you. You kind of want your pivot to be in the median of your data set for that partition. So, however, oh, and squared is the worst. A couple of properties of it. So, this is in place. I don't create any external um, 
auxiliary storage. So this is in place. In place, um, another property is its stability. So by doing these long swaps over here, uh, well, honestly, I'll just do it right over here. So let's say I have something like um, six, five, one A, two, one B, right? And let's just say immediately, right? Let's say my random pivot that I chose happens to be right here. Right, it happens to be right here. And so once these two, I swap these two, and this becomes one B. Oops. And uh, six. Notice how immediately one B and A have swapped relative locations. Immediately stability is broken. So because of these long swaps, and really anytime you do have these long swaps, stability is most often broken. It is usually not uh, upheld. So this is not a stable algorithm. So I'm not stable. We'll call it unstable, but I already wrote the word not. So I'm not going to write unstable. Not stable. And let's talk about the last one. So in place, stability. Is it adaptable? So quicksort is also not adaptable. Why is it not adaptable? Well, if I were to pass in a perfectly sorted array, well, it would go ahead and do the same thing it always does. It would pick a random pivot, swap it to the beginning, go all the way through, so on and so forth. It has no way of telling that an array is sorted or nearly sorted. And because of that, it can't even terminate in the middle of the algorithm either, right? So because of this, quicksort is not adaptable. Not adapt, oops. Adaptive is harder thought than I spell than I thought so. Cool, and so now we have kind of these three properties. We have, it's in place, we're not creating any auxiliary storage. It's not stable, right, because of those long swaps that are going on, and it's also not adaptive. Cool, one of the worst spellings I've done on this board in my career these five recitations, but I can't even look at that. It's just so ugly. Not adapt. Cool. Okay, nice. So that's kind of it on quicksort. If you have more questions, awesome, but I'm gonna wanna move on. I have 12 minutes left for Dijkstra's. I wanna make sure I get to that. So let's move over here and do a quick little uh, brush up on Dijkstra's. And this is kind of our last topic for the day. Look at the this tool over here. Nice, okay. So let's go into Dijkstra's. So Dijkstra's is an algorithm that basically tries to compute the minimum or the minimum cost path from one vertex to all the vertices in the graph. Um, and it kind of utilizes kind of a lot of the same concepts as PRIMS as we learned today. We have a priority queue, we can queue adjacent edges. Um, we have a visited set. Uh, the only other thing that we don't have is that instead of an edge set, we have a hash map. But a lot of the same features are really there. So what happens is, and also we perform it on a vertex. So let's perform this on, hmm, I'll perform it on, I'll perform it on G, because why not? Cool. So I'm going to add G. So the first step when we're doing Dijkstra's is we, add, we want to enqueue the current vertex, and we're going to add itself to the visited set in the same fashion we do with prints. We've already quote unquote visited G, um, so we're gonna have to the visited set. This distance map here is actually how, how we're representing all the distances found to all the vertices in the graph. Right? So what's actually happening is that A has a distance of infinity, right? as in it's not possible to get to A right now. And G, which makes sense, actually has a cost of zero. To get to G from G, well, that takes zero cost, right? Because I'm already at G. So the next step is once we've initialized all of our data structures, we've initialized our visited set, uh, our hash map, our priority queue, and then we're going to enqueue, uh, we're actually gonna go into the algorithm and we're going to, um, we're actually gonna dequeue first, not enqueue. So what we're doing is um, we're going to, well, it depends on the implementation. This one is adding all the adjacent edges first, which is fine as well. So I'm gonna go ahead and add all the adjacent edges from G. So this is GB with a weight of seven, right? So this is GB with a weight of seven. So zero plus seven is seven. So I'm gonna update this distance in the, in the map. And so what this is saying is that previously it took a cost of infinity to get to B, but zero plus seven, the cost to get from G to G and the cost to get from G to B, this seven over here, is less than infinity. So I'm actually gonna update the cost 
from infinity to seven. We'll see that. And then we're going to end up in queuing uh, BG7 to the priority queue. Yep. I'm going to go on to BE, uh, or sorry, GE. Notice the same thing's going to happen over here. Now I realize that, well, instead of being cost of infinity to get to E, I can get to E in a cost of two, right? And that's the cost of getting from G to G, zero, plus the cost of getting from G to E, which is two. So I'm going to update that cost in the map over here. Nice, two. And then from there, I'm going to do the same thing with F. Um, I realize that now, instead of getting being infinite cost to get to F, it's actually only a cost of zero. So I'm going to go ahead and add that to, I'm going to update this cost and add this to the priority queue as well. And then from there, I'm going to go on to H. H also has a cost of infinity before, but now it only has a cost of one. So I'm going to update that. And I'm going to add this edge, GH, uh, to the priority queue. Now, let's see. The priority queue is going to um, make sure it's order fulfilled. I'm going to dequeue the cheapest thing in the priority queue, which is F. And by doing this, by dequeuing F, I'm greedily taking this path over here. You see that as we go through the algorithm. I'm going to keep greedily choosing um, like a path to go on. So now I'm at F, but I have F to my visited set. As soon as I reach a vertex, I'm going to make sure that, assume, assuming that it's not in my visited set already, um, in which case I discard it. If it's not my visited set, I'm going to go ahead and visit it because I'm already at the, currently at that vertex. Same thing with D. So now notice that with D, D, the no cost to get to D is the cost to get from G to F, which is zero, uh, zero, plus the cost of FD, which is four. So zero plus four is equal to four, which is less than infinity. All right, so this is going to get overridden. Nice. And then from there, uh, from there, I'm going to iterate over the rest of these neighbors. It's going to go over to G. G, now notice I've already visited G. Since I've already visited the destination vertex, I actually end up not adding this edge to the priority queue because there's no reason to. I've already visited G. I've already found the minimum cost to get to G. So there's no point in adding it to my um, priority queue. So this is going to get discarded. Yep. Um, nothing happened there. And now I get to H. Yep, I did queued H. I'm going to visit H officially. And then I'm going to try and enqueue these two edges, although both of them are already visited. So this is going to get discarded. And this is going to get discarded as well. Next thing you know, I'm going to dequeue E. And by dequeuing E, what happens now is now I'm greet, you, know, you can see I'm greedily kind of taking this path over here. The cost to get to E is two, and I'm going to add the cost of getting to C. Well, the cost of getting to C is this cost, GE, plus the cost of E to C, three. So two plus three is actually the minimum cost to get to C. So what's going to happen now is that I'm going to update the cost of C in the map. Two plus three is five, much less than infinity. And I'm going to update this in the hash map. And then I'm going to add a weight of five. And so that's a weight of five I'm going to add to the priority queue. Maybe think, well, why am I not going to add this edge of three? Well, the edge of three is represented this cost to get from E to C. But what I care about is the cost to get from G to C, which includes this full path over here. right? So the vertex associated with it is still C, but I'm summing the cost along the path. right? So it's going to be two plus three, which is equal to five. So I'm adding C5 to the priority queue, right, as you can see right there. Cool. From then on, uh, I'm going to try and add this EG. Well, we'll see that EG is actually the cost is, I've already visited G, right? So there's no reason to add to the priority queue. And then I'm going to keep moving on. Now I go on to D. I'm going to keep just DQing the cheapest vertex. Um, and then I see that now I've visited, uh, I'm about to visit D officially. Yep. And then I'm going to iterate over its neighbors. I'm going to add a cost of eight or of nine to get to A, right? because it's the cost to get from G to D, right? Which is shown as four, right? Zero plus four is four. And then plus the new cost of this edge itself over here, which is five, right? So now this cost, I'm gonna add Q and edge of edge of uh, weight nine to the priority queue, right? Nine to the out of the priority queue, cool. From there, uh, we're gonna iterate over the rest of its neighbors, which includes B, same thing, five and one, or four and one is five. So I'm gonna add that and that uh, cost of B5 is going to add the priority queue. We'll see that this is actually going to eclipse um, this B7 that I added previously. It's actually better than that, right? It's better than this cost to get to B from over here. And we'll see that in a second, too. Cool. Um, after this, I'm going to try an F, but I've already been to that vertex, so I'm going to skip over it. And then I'm going to end up DQing B5 next. I DQ B5. Um, have I visited it? No. 
then I add it to my visited set, cool. And then from there, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to um, iterate over its neighbors. I see, okay, well, is the cost to get from G to B seven plus the cost of B to A, eight, so seven plus eight is 15. Is the cost of 15 already cheaper than the best possible, the best known uh, cost to get to A? Well, it isn't, right? Because I can go two, three, and two, right? That's seven. Or, uh, well, actually, I haven't even done that yet. The best possible cost right now is zero, four, and five, which is nine. So this is actually going to be eight or 13 is not better uh, than nine. So I'm actually going to end up skipping this. Wait, five plus eight. Oh, I sorry, I was taking taking this path instead of this one. <laughs> My bad. Yeah, so the cost of uh, five plus eight, 13, is not better than the cost of four plus five, nine. So I'm actually gonna end up not updating this path in the uh, distance map. So then I go on to C, I say is it faster to get to C? Five plus one is six, so going over here, five, four plus one plus one is uh, more expensive than going from two to three over here. So I end up discarding this as well. Um, and then I try and add D, I've already been to D, so that doesn't count. I've already been to G's, so that doesn't count either. I move over here to C. And the big thing with C over here I see is it's, I, now I can get a cost of five plus two to get to A, which is gonna be better than nine. So I actually get to update it in the distance map. Yeah, seven is better than nine, so I get to update that cost in the map. Um, and then I get to add a cost of A9 to the priority queue, cool. Um, I try and iterate over these edges, but I've already been to all of them. And then I get to A over here. I'm officially going to visit A. It's a shame this time I didn't get to, I never dequeued a vertex that was uh, had a lower cost. Um, but that's the point of the visited check at the beginning right when I first dequeue. But now I get to A, um, I try and iterate over its neighbors, but they're all visited. Um, and then the algorithm is gonna terminate because I've now visited every single vertex in the graph. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight in the visited set. I visited every vertex in the graph. I found the minimum cost to every single vertex in the graph. So that means that my algorithm is officially going to terminate. All right, and we'll see that just in a second when I hit step. Yep, I'll visit, vertices. I'll visit all vertices have been visited and now it's done. I know that was a lot. Vectors is difficult to cover in 10 minutes or so. Um, but another thing that's really important here is the complexity. And the complexity is, if I go back to one of these other ones, it is quantity O of, oops. O of V, V plus E log V. This is kind of coming from the same kind of logic we were using with prims earlier. Um, in the beginning, I'm going to be enqueuing E edges to the priority queue. That's cost of E. But I'm eventually going to be, end up dequeuing um, basically uh, V times, log V times. And so by, or I'm going to be dequeuing V times, which is why I'm applying that log V times. Um, and so doing so, it's basically the cost of breadth first search or DFS, but I'm now tacking on this log V term and applying that to both the V and the E. So that's the reasoning why isn't incredibly important for this course, I feel like. Uh, the most important thing is if you remember this, if you ever asked to regurgitate it, best average and worst case is O of V plus the quantity V plus E log V. So knowing that, um, hopefully, I don't know if there are any questions. If there are, feel free to ask them, even though I haven't gotten one all night. Um, regardless, thank you guys so much for tuning in. I'll hang on for a second to make sure there are any more questions. But it has been a pleasure being your TA for this semester. And uh, oops. And I wish you guys the best of luck on finals. And um, I'm looking forward to seeing how you guys do. So I'll stick a little, stick around, mumble for a little bit longer. Um, but pretty cool that this is the last recitation for the semester of spring 2020. So thank you to Sanjana and Sadhu for being the recitation um, Piazza monitors, um, monitoring the Piazza questions, even though there weren't any for this, for this session. So kind of easy money um, <laughs> for this hour and 15 minutes. But regardless, I'm still thankful that you guys were there. So if it's 7.16, I'll probably can the stream. Um, but it was a pleasure.